Well, good afternoon, everyone, again. Good to see you. Uh, today, we have the Takash Quartet, world-renowned string quartet. And in, in your program, you will see that uh, one of the uh, violinists has mentioned has a little section there that he talks about the pieces or the composers being influenced by home in these compositions. That has some uh, applicability in some instances, but not all. Uh, do these type, type of extra musical influences have any, can you hear it in the music? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Certainly home, you think of maybe sentimental Feelings. Well, there's certainly nothing sentimental about the pieces you're going to hear today. So, do, can those things influence the music? Well, let's talk about one particular case where it didn't, and that is Beethoven's Heiligenstadt um, Testament. Heiligenstadt is a little town in Germany where Beethoven was, and he wrote a letter to his brothers, lamenting his oncoming deafness. And he even considered suicide in this letter. But what music was he composing when he wrote this letter? It was the Pastoral Symphony, probably his most joyous uh, piece. So in his case, I mean, he was in the depths of despair of his oncoming deafness, but it didn't affect the, uh, the piece that he was writing. So it can, and sometimes it can't. And I'm not, I don't want to dwell on this too much. This, I don't want to sound like I'm denigrating what's written in your program notes. It does have some validity. And if you hear it, great. That, uh, if you don't, great. You know, so I'm, I'm, I want you to listen. That's what I want you to do. And uh, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. First uh, piece on the on the program is the Benjamin Britten Quartet Number One. You can see he died in uh, he was 63 years old when he died. He, when he was three months old, he had uh, pneumonia and it severely affected his heart. So he was kind of in, in uh, compromised health for most of his life. He was extraordinarily prolific at an early age. He said he wrote reams and reams of music before he was a teenager, and over a hundred pieces by the time he was a teenager. When he was 14 years old, he started uh, composition lessons with Frank Bridge, and that's another name that you should explore. I think Frank Bridge's music is just really wonderful, and it, you'll be rewarded if you do. And he moved to, um, America in 1939. One of the reasons was that his, the critical reviews of his work in, in the UK were pretty negative, and plus the war. So he and his partner, uh, the, the tenor uh, Peter Pears, moved to Hollywood in 1939. And even in the United States, he got some pretty bad reviews, and there was one uh, a critic in New York that said gave him always severe and spiteful reviews. Both of them, uh, Piers and Britain, were pacifists, and homosexuality was still a, a crime, capital crime, in England in that time. So they, they left uh, and went back in April of 1942 after the composition of the String Quartet, which was written in 1941. He was 27 years old when he wrote this, but there were two previous quartets, one when he was 15 and one when he was 18. The one he would, that composed when he was 18 wasn't published until 1975. This was commissioned by Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, who was a supporter and commissioner of chamber music uh, from 
famous uh, composers worldwide. And the commissions that she had were, it reads, like, it reads like a who's who of 20th century composers. Barber, Bartok, Copland, Ravel, Poulenc, Prokofiev, Schoenberg, and Stravinsky. And here's what Britton said about this piece. Oh, I went too far. There. It took him three months, months to, to uh, compose it, but he needed the cash. So it doesn't sound like he was thinking about home too much. Back to the quartet. Four movements. One thing you'll notice about this quartet, a lot of it is very soft. It's written with uh, pianissimo a lot, and sometimes it says to fade to nothing. So uh, the, the first movement is characterized by two different motives. One is the ethereal open, opening, which we'll hear. And that's followed immediately by a very energetic section. And those two themes uh, reoccur all the way through this moment, movement. And there's one interesting place where he dissolves this energetic theme into the opening theme. If you know Peter Grimes, the opera, he wrote right after he returned to England. This, this sound is very reminiscent of the sounds of the sea in Peter Grimes. Uh, uh, Britain grew up in Alderborough, right on the North Sea. So he has the sound, the feeling of the sea in his mind on, on, in many of his works. And it ends... Uh, just like it starts. Very magical, the way it just fades away with pizzicatos. The second movement is uh, a scherzo-like movement, very quick. And it starts out with this, these repeated chords, but then you get in, again, softly, but then you get these interjections, these sudden interjections from uh, the, the different instruments. There's 
a word that you don't see too often, conslancio. Anybody know what slancio means? Momentum, with momentum. And this thing chugs along, just like that, the whole way, the whole way to the end. And it's, all, it's punctuated by these sharp rhythm, rhythms and interjections the whole way through. And it ends quietly, almost. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> uh, the third movement is dominated by this slow droning theme uh, the whole way through. movement is predominantly in this vein, soft. And the, uh, the last movement is, is a fast movement. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, uh, you know, I've talked about the, the Bartok the last time, is how dense the structure is. It's hard to hear what he's doing. You have to kind of look at the score and see it. With Britain's music, it's it's much more clear. It's, you can actually hear what's going on without actually having to see it in the score. And it's, it's interesting how this theme starts here, echoed here, but then it's passed around through each instrument. And it's very clear to hear that. In Bartok, sometimes you, just, you, he, you can see he's doing that, but you just can't hear it because the structure is so dense. So let's hear this. And now he combines that theme in the cello, and the, the, uh, the viola and the two violins are playing this much broader theme over the top of that. And it ends very energetically, with, uh, based on the, on, on the initial theme from the be beginning. It's a very good piece. Uh, I think you'll enjoy this. I certainly do. Bella Bartok. It's interesting that we have two string quartets playing Bartok right back to back. To back. I hope they, you don't mind that. <laughs> uh, that and this is an interesting picture of Bartok. You usually don't see him kind of smiling. Usually it's a very severe uh, portrait of him. But this, I found this one, I thought it would be interesting to see this. He wrote this, uh, he started it in 1939 when he was living in Switzerland. He moved back to Budapest uh, when the war started and he finished it in November that same year. His mother died in December and then his wife and he took a, what at that time was a quite perilous trip uh, across the Atlantic to New York in 1940. 
and he died in New York in, in uh, 1945. He was 65 years old. The last month, I mentioned a uh, Kerschel catalog of Mozart's works, the K numbers that you see at the end of Mozart works. Well, Bardock has these as the numbers, named for Andras Schulze, who was a, a, a musicologist that undertook the first cataloging of, of Britain's, of uh, Bartok's works. There have been, been two subsequent cataloging, trying to put things in, in chronological order, but this is the one you see most of the time. This was premiered in 1941 in the New York City Town Hall by the Kolisch String Quartet. And it's interesting, the Times reviewer said that Bartok provided no programmatic intentions to the work. So, was home on his mind? It, it may have been, but he didn't say. All four movements start with the exact same theme. And it's marked Mesto. Mesto, anyone? Sad. Let's hear that. That's followed by a, a quick figure that appears all through the movement and in all parts. See what I mean about music being dense. I mean, there is a lot of imitation going on in there, but you really can't hear it because everything is so closely put together. And one of the, the devices that he will use throughout this piece is uh, one is called augmentation. When you draw out the note values to make the, the theme longer, for example, Ba 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 bum, bum 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 bum. That's augmentation, drawn out. The other one is diminution, where everything is, the the uh, meters are all. It makes it's faster. So here's an an example of that. If you can see that, let's play it again. That's a, a variation of that theme, but it's drawn out, it's not fast. And the second movement starts uh, with this theme in the cello. You can follow along. It's interesting, the other three parts have uh, their mutes on. Uh, mute is a thing that clamps on the sound bridge that makes a, a really gauzy, hazy sound. And this isn't followed immediately 
by this macabre march. <laughs> And then it's immediately followed. There are a lot of uh, sections in, in this movement that are uh, very different from each other. There's this uh, Hungarian sounding interlude, kind of a folkish sounding thing, complete with strumming guitars. Uh, and the third movement starts again with this Mesto theme. And then he switches gears in um, the section called burletta, which is a burlesque. And it's very sardonic and it kind of glumps along and you get this big laugh in the second bar. <laughs> And that, those elements maintain them the whole way through this movement and until you get to the end and just kind of fades away. This is the last movement. Again, there's that opening theme, and then it, the cello comes in with it again. Again, it, it'll be hard to hear because it, it, it's so dense. But hopefully that you've heard it enough times now that you'll be able to catch it. This, this whole movement is dominated by that theme. The other ones, it was just stated at the outset and then moved on to other ideas, but this theme now will dominate the, the whole movement. And there's this section that, that kind of an eerie section that the strings are told to play senza colore, without color, dull. And uh, with that theme uh, stretched out, it's augmented. And hopefully you'll be able to, to hear it, you hope you've heard it enough now, that you'll be able to hear it, but here it is. And the movement ends uh, with a statement of the opening theme against Pizzicato's and the other voices with some quite unexpected chords.
those major chords come as quite a surprise after you've heard all of what we call dizziness the whole way through, but it adds a very calm closure to the whole work. Next on the program is Dvorak. In 1892, Dvorak was a world-famous composer, and he was offered the position of director of the National Conservatory of Music in New York City by Jeanette Thurber, who was the wife of a grocery magnate, wholesaler, and she was an, a very well-known arts patron of the time. They offered him $15,000 a year, which in today's money was, was about half a million dollars. Uh, he found that hard to, to say no to, and it was about 25 times what he was making at the Prague Conservatory where he was teaching. He was not particularly happy in, in New York, but two of his most famous pieces were written here. The New, New World Symphony, his Ninth Symphony, and the Cello Concerto, probably his, his most famous two pieces. In the summer of 1893, he found through a friend a bohemian enclave in, of all places, Spillville, Iowa, where he moved, spent summer there, and he was very happy there. And he wrote the quartet that immediately precedes this one, and it's called the American Quartet. This is... Oh, seemed to be... Uh, here we go. This is a statue of, of Dvorak that was erected in Stuyvesant Square in New York City in 1997. It was immediately opposite the house that he lived in, in New York City, which was ripped down in 1991. But the uh, Dvorak American Heritage Society, in conjunction with the New York Philharmonic, had this erected right across the street from where the house was. This is the, the movements of the quartet. Uh, because of the de financial depression in 1893, that it became hard to, to keep the uh, conservatory running. So he returned uh, to Bohemia in 1895, and he wrote this quartet right after he returned home. The first movement is in typical Sonata Allegro form. We remember what that is? Let's have a refresher. What's the first uh, element of Sonata Allegro form? Exposition, right? That's where you state your themes. This is what this movement is going to be about. Next comes development. Seem to be skipping. I gave away the next answer. <laughs> next comes. Very good, very good. You were here. <laughs> and finally, the end, right? Coda. So, with your knowledge, of Sonata Allegro form, you should be able to follow this movement pretty well. I mean, the, his themes are very clear, very, very well set out. And here's the first theme of the first movement. Assuming our quartet takes the exposition repeat, as we know there's always a, an exposition repeat, uh, you'll know it when that happens because you'll hear that again. And the second theme of the uh, exposition is this. <laughs> So, you've heard all you need to know. 
it to, fo to follow this movement the whole way through, and uh, I, hope, I hope you can. The second movement is another uh, Sonata Allegro form, and it has a, a very stately opening theme. It's interesting, the development section is that theme, but in the minor. And most of the development is in the minor key, but it reverts to the major when he gets to the recap of that movement. Now, we haven't talked about, the third movement is of Scherzo. Or, uh, scherzo. We haven't talked ab about the form of the minuet or the scherzo in classical and uh, late classical pieces up until the Romantic uh, period. Usually it was the third movement, if you've got four movement work, the, uh, the scherzo or the minuet was the third movement, and that's, that moved around. That was not always set in stone. Haydn put it everywhere. He put it first, he put it last, he put it uh, before the slow movement, so it, it, it's not set in stone, but typically it's the third movement. So the form is A, B, Oh, I've got this back. A, B, C, D, A, B. Sorry, that typo there. But these, this double bar here indicates repeat. So you play A, A, and you play B, B, and you play C, C, and then D, D, and then you do what's called a da capo to the head, to the front, and you repeat A, B. And that's what he, he does. That's the, his form. Now, the, the, the first uh, theme is, has a very Slavic feel to it. It's reminiscent of a lot of his Slavonic dances. Failed to mention that these scherzos and minuets are almost always in triple meter. Uh, sometimes they're in two, but most of the time they're in threes. And the uh, the center section, the C D section, is usually of a very contrasting nature. And this is his section. Then to the da capo, back to the A and B section. The fourth movement starts with a slow introduction, but then it really takes off. movements like that really uh, races right along but then he toward the end he introduces the themes from the first movement so you get that this, get this kind of cyclical uh, form first movement theme And then he caps it off with a rousing coda.
So this is my last talk for this season. I'll be starting up again next season. And I realize that a half hour is not a, a lot of time to be able to, to explore these pieces in depth. And we could spend a half an hour on just one piece. Sometimes you can spend a half an hour on just one movement. But I hope I've given you, given you enough information that, that makes these pieces more understandable and enjoyable. And as I've said before, music, listening to music can be both a mental, intellectual, and an emotional experience. When you can combine the two, that's where, it, to me, it opens up a new world. Uh, and on one final note, it's my email address. <laughs> now, if there's anything that you've thought that I should be talking more about or less about, <laughs> just pop me an email and let me know what, you, what things you would like, to, uh, like me to talk about next year. Uh, I can't say that I'll take everybody's suggestions, but I, I will certainly read them and, and take them to heart. So thank you for coming uh, this year, and uh, well, we'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.